TorahCafe.com. Just a moment of introduction, etc. In my journey of being a Holocaust educator in Miami, Florida, at the University of Miami, and for the public school district, I couldn't have done what I do by myself ever. So I see people are still coming in, so. And one of the people who have been my tremendous support in the past 28, 30 years that I've been doing this work is a senior scholar at the United States Holocaust Museum. And he's the expert on the ship St. Louis. Actually, he actually has tracked down all the survivors of the St. Louis, what happened to them when they went back to Europe, and wrote the book Refuge Denied. And since my children couldn't be here, or my grandchildren, or any family, am I lucky to have the senior staff researcher from the United States Holocaust Museum, my longtime colleague and friend here to support me, Scott Miller. He'll be staying the rest of the morning, so if you want to ask him any questions, uh, he will be glad to talk to you. So my talk is about 35 to 38 minutes long, depending on how fast I talk. A couple of things that I want to say ahead of time. I have to balance reading my script, technology, moving the slides to match the story, and getting very thirsty all the time which many of you probably have the same issue I do with the meds that you take. You get very thirsty. So if you keep seeing me doing this, that's the reason. Are there any Holocaust survivors in the room? I want to honor you. Are there any second generation or third generation daughters, grandchildren? I certainly want to honor you. So, uh, let me begin my story. Today's presentation is not specifically about the Holocaust, but certainly because of the Holocaust. Yet, it is more a story of escape, hiding, and being on the run from Nazi Holocaust. An often overlooked piece of the history that I hope to bring to you today. It is also a story which resonates with our Jewish people in exile. Come up, it's okay. Fleeing from tyranny and that it is also about immigration, thank you, the difficulties of reaching safety for our Jewish families and how those of us got here and where we are today in our communities. I have a story to tell you. It is my story. It is my testimony as a child survivor of the Holocaust. Every talk I give, I give in memory and honor of my parents and my brother. So they're on top, and this is the story I'll tell you is my father, the late Rabbi Moshe Klein, my mother, the late Sarah Klein, my brother, the late federal judge Ted Klein, and the last picture is the last teacher Holocaust Institute that my mother attended at age 99. I am the only one left of this family. Let me begin this journey with you. Growing up in America, I was always searching my past. I never quite understood how I played a role in the history of the Holocaust. I went to public school, I went to college, and Indiana University. I never studied the Holocaust, but then 
when I became an English teacher and was teaching the book Night by Elie Wiesel, there on page 23 at the bottom, it says, the train stopped in Kushitsa and all the Jews of Kushitsa were put on the train and when they arrived there, they were all gassed. And I was about 24 years old when I read that and I went, oh my God, I was born in Kushitsa. I knew that, but I didn't know details. And I realized that I would have been one of the Kushit Jews gassed at Auschwitz. So to fast forward, because of time, after becoming an English teacher for 30 years, I applied for a program on how to teach the Holocaust in Israel by the American Gathering of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. And when I came back from that trip in Miami, I suddenly became famous. I was one of the first teachers in the country who was being specifically trained and the Holocaust Memorial in Miami Beach was being built. How many of you have been there with the big arm? So they transferred me from the school I was teaching at to Miami Beach High School because the memorial is basically on the grounds near Miami Beach High School and suddenly I became the Holocaust educator for the Dade County Public Schools. It didn't happen so quickly, there was a lot of politics, but it happened. So what I did was I had a little, uh, at that time, cubicle seat at the Holocaust Memorial. And um, one day I walked in and the secretary said, Miriam, there's a book for you. And sitting on the desk was a book about this big. You flipped it over and there were lots of pictures in it. And I read it and I went, oh my goodness, these are ships that arrived here from Europe carrying Jews in 1940 and 41. And there was a picture of the ship that I arrived on, the Ciudad de Seville. It was the first time that I'd ever seen it mentioned in history or in a book. Well, I started flipping the pages and on the bottom it said, for further information, be sure and call the Hayas number, Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, New York, and ask for Valerie Bajarov. So I did, and Valerie came on the phone with a heavy Russian accent, and he said, may I help you? And I said, yes, my name is Miriam Klein, uh, and I arrived on that ship that's in the book, and I don't know anything else about my past, and and he said, wait a minute, what's your name? And I said, Miriam Klein. Today I'm known as Miriam Klein Kasanov. He said, where are you from? And I said, Koshitsa. He said, can I call you back in 15 minutes? And I thought, sure. I've heard that before. I'll probably never hear from him again. And in 15 minutes, he called back. See, I keep looking there because I'm not used to it. I will get to the fate of the two sisters. And he said... Was your mother's name Sarah Serenka? And I said, yeah. Was your dad's name Moritz? And I said, yes. And were you Maria at one time? And by now, I'm getting shivers up my arm. And I said, yes. And he said, and you had a brother, Tibor? Yes. <laughs> he said, I have your debarkation papers right in front of me when you arrived in America. And we've been looking for you. My job is to find all the passengers from this ship. And I went, oh my God, I finally found my past. So um, this was about, by the way, only 15 years ago. So he, I said, well, at the time, there was no scanning or faxing, so maybe it was 20 years ago, I don't know. Uh, he said, no, we can't do that. These are very important documents. The only way you can get them, I have all your papers, is to come to New York. I have to tell you, it took me six months to go. I couldn't process that I finally was going to find out all the information that I wanted to. At the time, my parents were living. 
I didn't even tell them. And I finally did go. And what he gave me was a plastic folder notebook of my whole history of our family leaving Slovakia, how we got to America, document upon document like this. Well, I brought it home and I thought, now what do I do with this? I'm not a researcher, I'm not a historian. And I don't think I'm much of a scholar, although many people think that I am. And I'm an English teacher, basically, or I was at that time. So what I did, because I knew there was a story there that I had to tell, so what I did was I took all those papers, and I live in like a two-bedroom apartment, and I spread them all out on the floor, and every day I would just put each one in chronological order of the date, and then I wrote this story, filled in with, since then I've gotten my doctorate degree, with academic research, with people like Scott Miller, my source scholar that's here, and I put together this story. So here's how it goes. In the early 1930s, my dad, a blessed memory, Rob Moshe Klein, was a rabbinical student in Kosice, Slovakia. In order to complete his education, he went to the prestigious Munkac Yeshiva nearby to get his smicha. It was near but far enough that he had to live in Munkac while there. Besides his smicha, his goal was to bring home a Jewish bride to the Klein family in Kosice, where people of the Klein family eagerly awaited the event, including my late grandfather, Rav Abraham Klein, the head rabbi of Kosice, which was a Hungarian city in 1938. Then, by 1940, when most of the Jewish men in the community were taken to a Hungarian forced labor battalion camp and put to hard labor by the Hungarian army who were trained by the Nazis. Back to the story. My, her, my dad heard there were two beautiful sisters in the home of Rob David Schwartz in Munkac, and they were twins. Hmm, two beautiful women. Why not? So, as the story goes, my dad managed to get invited to the home of Rob David Schwartz for Shabbat. And there, he was able to enjoy the company of the city's beautiful twins, Lily and Sarah. How could he tell them apart? Only a romantic can know, but he fell in love with Lily. However, Lily did not fall in love with him. In fact, she couldn't stand him. She already had a boyfriend in mind, and so began the conspiracy of the twins of Munkach. My Aunt Lily conspired with Sarah to pass my dad off to her. And honestly, according to my parents, up to the weeks prior to the marriage, my dad never knew. When he was finally told, he shrugged and he said, okay, so we'll learn to love each other. And they did for over 65 years. As the story moves on, my dad brought Sarah home to Kosice to the Klein family, which was a very revered and respected family in Kosice. I was born, there's a picture of me before I left Europe, the firstborn named Marika, and then the winds of war. Although my dad had gotten support papers from my mother's other sister, Bessie, you have to follow this now, who had met a traveling Jewish businessman from Chicago, my uncle Abraham, and they were both at that time living in Chicago safely in the United States. 
However, my mother would not entertain the thought in 1939 of leaving all that she loved and knew to a strange land she did not want to go. Besides, she still wanted another baby. And so we had my brother Tibor, who was born in March of 1940, otherwise known today in Florida as the Honorable Judge Ted Klein, late Honorable Judge Ted Klein. Then when the Nazis occupied Slovakia in 1939 and took all the leading men of the community to the Hungarian fascist labor camps, including my dad, my mother realized her mistake because we witnessed my father being taken from our home. However, in December of 1940, my father managed to escape the camp from the Hungarian labor work camp. It was called Sharash Potok, where he had been a prisoner for a few months. When he rushed home to our family in Kosice, he finally convinced my mother, Sarah, to embark on an escape route to Lisbon, Portugal, where there were ships waiting to take Jews to safety, if one could make the journey in such perilous times. So there's a picture of me, and then these are pictures that Yad Vashem put together for me of life in uh, Kashitsa before we left. There's pictures of Jewish life in Kashitsa, Kasha as it was called. And there's the journey. It was perilous to try to get from Slovakia all the way over to Lisbon, Portugal. It seemed that my dad, without my mother knowing it, had made all these arrangements with my aunt in Chicago before he was taken to the labor camp. Reluctantly and with much fear, Sarah agreed to leave Cushel and all she dearly loved, knowing that if she did not, my father would be recaptured, taken back to the labor camp, and ultimately would have been murdered. She tried to convince my Aunt Lily, her twin sister, and her family, because she had married her boyfriend and had two little girls, to come with us. But Lily refused, saying, Sarah, what will happen to us here will happen to you on the run. I am staying. And that was the last time that my mother or I ever saw my aunt again. So my mother took me, Marika, a small child of four, and my new infant brother, Tibor, who was nine months old, and along with my father, we fled in December of 1940 from Kosice and all that we knew to all we did not yet know. My parents were only 33 years old. The following is the story and the chronology of how we made that miraculous escape as I have pieced it together in the research that I did from the day I went to New York and got my papers. It's 1940, November, Dad got out of the camp. December, we begin our journey of escape. My dad returns home to Kushitsa. He retrieves the visa, pictures and papers that I just showed you, and passenger reservation to board a ship called the Nyasa, which was due to leave Lisbon on April 15, 1941. So now it's December 1940, so we should have plenty of time to get to the Nyasa and to Lisbon. However, as we were rushing and running to make the deadline of our visa entry papers in Lisbon, Portugal, expired on January 18, 1941. And due to train delays and many more unexpected events, we missed that deadline by two days. Thus, we arrived in the border town of Barajos, Spain on January 20th, 1941, and found ourselves hopelessly and frustratingly stopped on our journey. Permit me to read to you a powerfully emotional research document given to me by the Hayas. Now, the way I understand it is they arrested us in Spain. Spain was 
not occupied, but they didn't want to anger the Nazis. They were playing it both ways. So they would allow Jews who had come through to stay for a week or two in a hotel, and then if you didn't get your paperwork together and get yourself on to Lisbon, they would ship you back to your country of origin. So it just so happens that in that hotel, my dad had already run out of most of his money, bribing people along the way, but we, were, we did have enough to stay in the hotel, but we, didn't, we had to get our paperwork to get into Lisbon. So in that hotel, according to my parents, there was a non-Nazi German tourist, a good guy. And he felt so terrible about this young little family being trapped in the hotel that he said to my dad, I will dictate a letter to you and you write it and I will get it out to the authorities in Lisbon for you, to the Jews in Lisbon. So this is the letter, this is the original letter. And as I read it, I do get emotional because of what my dad says. And also what's really fascinating is that I, I know darn well that these are not his words, but they're the German's words, but it worked because we got out. So this is what the letter says. Honorable Jewish Aid Society of Lisbon. We are a Jewish family from Hungary on the way to the United States of America. Because of the American Council in Budapest gave us a travel visa. Because I have been accepted as a rabbi in the congregation Ateret Israel in Chicago. Unfortunately, our Portuguese visa ran only till the 18th of January, and because of train delays which have consumed us, we only arrived here in Barajos in Spain on the 20th. The Portuguese council here sent a dispatch on January 20th to the Lisbon police requesting an extension of our visa because we have paid our clipper tickets and therefore have secured the trip to America. But until today, we have no answer. This is the part that touches me. We are here with two small children, a four-year-old little girl and a baby boy of two months. The children are hungry. We are used to hunger, but it is tragic to see how it affects my innocent children. Hence, if it is possible, please help me, me your Jewish brother, because the situation is tragic. We are not even in a situation to pay for the hotel because my money is gone. We have money in a Lisbon bank, but we can't get to the money because it's in Lisbon. Rabbi Maurice Klein from Kasha, Hungary. Perhaps you could intervene with the police on our behalf in order to complete the process. Our freedom of movement is limited. We are interned in this hotel room and we are not allowed out. Please attempt my Jewish brothers to help me in whatever way you can. We are here in this hotel, Dos Naciones, so you can see from the letterhead on the stationery. I thought he was quite naive. Perhaps you could telephone me. <laughs> that would be very generous of you. <clears throat> so it appears that from the chronology of this letter that we are very soon after allowed to enter Lisbon. Now it is February 15, 1941. We finally arrived in Lisbon on February 15, 1941 after running throughout Eastern Europe, always one step ahead of Nazi occupation. We went through Hungary, Yugoslavia, Italy, France, and Spain, where, as I just read to you of our plight, where I was detained, our family, a four-year-old, a nine-month-old baby, and my parents. We had been on the road for three months, and as previously mentioned, the Nyasa ship was leaving on April 15th, so we had time to make the ship for which we had passage 
just not the entire pay ticket we would discover. How much do you think it cost in 1941 for a Jew to get out on a ship like this? $1,000. So that answers a lot of other questions about why didn't the Jews flee. In addition, we now had one more serious problem. Our visa entry papers to the United States, we learned, were due to expire on March 13th. Once again, we had to get new visa papers, which had to be acquired in order to make the April 15th departure of the ship. The lines at the consul office, these were all the requirements that one needed to get out of Europe at that time for a Jew. The lines at the consul office were long with other refugees in the same dilemma. What were we to do? The government in Lisbon had only promised to let the refugees remain. Let me explain to you, Lisbon at that time was the single most important point of embarkation for Jews from Europe <clears throat> who wanted to go to the United States. Portugal was a neutral country, and more than 70,000 refugees passed through the port during the war. In the 1942 Hollywood classic, Casablanca, Lisbon is the destination for the, re for the refugees stranded in Morocco because of its transatlantic connections and because it was a city crowded with foreigners of all nationalities, it became a rendezvous spot for spies and a hotbed of intrigue. It is very difficult to overstate to you the anxieties of those of us wishing to flee the Nazis. One observer took measure of the atmosphere saying, <clears throat> outside the sun beats down in muggy waves, but inside, Fear, like a blanket of dark web, lies over the lives of the Jews. Fear that visas may expire before a destination can be reached. Fear that each new border check might bring a gruff order to get off the train and turn back. Fear that scanty funds may not last until a safe place is reached in the new world. Fear that an outbreak of war in a new place will slam the gates to freedom. Fears by the hundreds, by the thousands. And that's what we felt, and that's what I remember when people ask me what I remember. The lines at the consul office were long with other refugees in the same dilemma. What were we to do? The government in Lisbon said you could stay for a while, but then it's time to go back. So what they did was <clears throat> they put... Jewish people, the Jew, Jewish refugees, into uh, pensions, little hotels and little houses and little homes, and uh, took very good care of us. There were about a thousand Jew, Jewish families in 1941 in Lisbon. And so people, Jewish refugees, waited by the shores for their ships constantly as we were one of them. Finally, February 15th, to April 28, 1941. The next step was to house us. So while we were waiting, we were put into a pension. My mother, Sarah, remembers it well. For all, in all this chaos and horror, it was a pleasant enough place to stay, except for the constant anxiety and fear she felt of the unknown. For me, as a child, my memories are of much anxiety, fear, and insecurity, listening to my parents speaking in Yiddish and Hungarian about what would become of us. The government officials, although Lisbon was neutral, according to one testimony I read, were wanting to put all of us in prison. But the local Jewish community leaders of Lisbon, small as they were in numbers, about a thousand Jews, prevailed and convinced the authorities to place us in pensions or small hotels. We are very grateful to that Lisbon community. By the way, 
There were, as I was to find out in my research that many of you might be interested in, many other now famous dignitaries of history waiting with us, such as Marc Chagall, the artist, Hannah Arendt, the writer-philosopher, Peggy Guggenheim, who had been going back and forth from New York, uh, the, the art aficionado, and she was stuck there. And I just discovered Ian Fleming and many others. Interestingly, in their bios, if you Google them, none of this period of time is mentioned. It just says they fled Nazi Europe. So what follows during this period of time, February 15th to April, is information that I received and retrieved through those documents from the Hayas office. March 21, 1941. The Lisbon Hayas office from the Chicago office finally got the $1,000 needed for the passage on the ship for which we had reservations, the Nyasa. But it was sailing April 15th, and we didn't get all the papers and monies in time, and so our family watched from the shoreline as the ship left without us. Now what are we going to do? Well, the Hayas offices were trying to get the funds together, not only for the $1,000 passage money from my aunt in Chicago, but there was also a $300 processing fee. I say that with a smile because there's always bureaucracy, even when Jews were trying to escape Nazi Europe. So they were trying to get the processing fee also. Back to the chronology, March 21st, 1941, Portugal, monies for the passage for the ship arrives. April 15th, the ship leaves without us because our visa papers to the United States had expired. Once again, my dad and mother had to now make new decisions and plans, anything not to have to return to Slovakia, although my mother would have been very glad at this point to take her two small children and either give us away for safety or go home. She just had had it. May 15th, finally, we board the Ciudad de Sevilla. The Hayas had arranged this passage. It was a huge passenger and cargo liner, one of the last ships to leave Lisbon to America in 1941. That's a picture of the ship, which I found, Scott, at the museum. <laughs> had it just been six months later, January 1942, the final solution was planned to murder all the Jews of Europe. We had left just in time. June 3rd, 1941, although my dad did not keep a diary of the trip, I do have my mother's memories, as well as a diary kept a friend of mine whose father was a small child when we were on the last ship in September 41. Uh, that is, the, she was on the Navamar, which was one of the last ships. And here I have an article from the New York Times, buried in the Times, about an overloaded ship that arrived, not ours. I can almost say with certainty that any description of the ships that arrived with Jews would have been the same as what we experience. I quote from my mother's memories and from a source of a biography about Chagall, about the conditions of the ship. The dangers that lay ahead from the moment they left Lisbon and boarded the ship assaulted the passengers. From the first day at sea, rumors circulated there was a shortage of drinking water. Passengers panicked as distraught mothers worried about their small children. The ship could not sail a direct course as German Navy had turned the Atlantic Ocean into a maritime battlefield. Submarines lurked beneath rising and falling waves, stalking freighters and passenger ships. The seas turned turbulent 
and the ship plowed through storms, heaving dangerously from side to side. Many were sick from the turbulence, and <clears throat> when the storm subsided and the sea was calm, the observant Jews on board were seen on deck, as was my father, putting on their talit, prayer shawls, and praying to God to get us to safety after all we had been through, not to die on the ship not to be thrown into the ocean. My mother was terrified, not letting me out of her sight. I do remember that, I remember. Our ship stopped in Cuba for one day. I have no further information on that yet. And now I quote to you from another book. One morning, I quote because I know this was our experience, but this is said better than I could say it. One morning, a flock of gulls appeared swooping down and sailing gracefully on the crests of foam-laced waves. Gulls, said the passengers, we must be approaching land. Our family realized, New York, America, we had arrived safely in the harbor of Ellis Island. Arrival in New York City, June 1941. We disembark into the turmoil of immigration, answering questions, pushing, crowded, handing over documents, officials asking questions, my dad desperately searching for our papers, my mom grasping my hand for dear life while holding on to my infant brother in her arms. All this I do remember. My mom and dad searching endlessly in the crowd for my Aunt Bessie. Where is she? A familiar face for someone to help us where to go, what to do. I can feel and breathe my parents' fear, and I'm afraid too, for no one is there to greet us. My aunt did not receive notification in time for her to make plans to leave Chicago. Many of us were in the same situation. No money was left, no family to meet us. Strange new land, we can't speak the language, small children in tow. Once again, the Hayas did help us out. They put us into a shelter. For those of you who are from New York, we were sheltered in 425 Lafayette Street. Finally, after about two weeks, my aunt showed up from Chicago. She arrived and we left the shelter to begin our new lives in America. It was June 1941. The world and American Jewry did not yet know the horrors and the fate that awaited the rest of European Jews who were not as lucky as we were. They would know soon, all too soon. So what became of the Klein family left behind in Kosice? I wanted to show you this. I found my uh, papers from the ship. And you can see where the Klein family is circled. My favorite part of this is that they don't know my age, four or five. So my daughter always says, Mom, we're a year younger. So <laughs> thank you very much for finding my papers. So what happened to the rest of the Jews in um, Europe and, and Kosice? Of the 15,000 Jews of Kosice, 12,000 were immediately gassed upon the arrival in Auschwitz in 1944 on the same train that Elie Wiesel was on. So if you, I go back to the beginning of my talk, if you pick up your book of night, turn to page 23 on the bottom, it says all the Jews of Kosice were picked up on the train that he was on, and then when they arrived, all the Jews of Kosice were gassed immediately. So what happened to my grandfather, my grandmother, and my aunts and my uncles? Well, my grandfather had ultimately escaped the labor camp, as did my uncles. And since my grandfather was the head of the Judenrat in Kosice, he found an attic to hide in. And so the entire Klein family was hiding in an attic that day when the train came through to pick up all the Jews. And they survived because they had Gentile neighbors who had told them 
that if you're ever in trouble and we can help you, we're here for you. So the day the train picked up all the Jews of Kosciuszko, my grandfather, my grandmother, my uncles, my aunts all came down from the attic. And here they are, the only Jews in Kosciuszko. They quickly ran to their Gentile neighbors who hid them in caves, something I will never understand how one lives in a cave. And that's a whole other story. Um, 300 Jews returned to Kosciuszko immediately after the war. Among them, the Klein family, who all ultimately immigrated to Israel, Bolivia, and the United States. We, of course, were already here. So, what happened to our little family? My parents wanted an American child as soon as we arrived in America. So, my brother, Henry Klein, was born. I swear to you that they named him after the O. Henry chocolate bar because they didn't know where the relatives were and my mother loved O. Henry. So today my younger brother is Hank Klein who's a very prominent businessman uh, in um, Miami, Florida, once a partner to Jeb Bush. Uh, I became who I am I am the director of Holocaust education for South Florida, Miami-Dade schools, and the University of Miami. And Tibor, the nine-month-old baby that we schlepped across from Europe, so he was appointed the first federal judge by President Bush to sit on the federal bench in 2004, the first child survivor to sit on the federal bench. You can imagine the joy in my family. My mother literally cavelled every time she said, my son, the judge. And then in the fall of 2006, tragedy struck. Ted suddenly died. Right after he was initiated into being a federal judge, there was mold in the Miami courthouse that affected him. My dad, a blessed memory, was the associate rabbi at Temple Emanuel in Miami Beach. He died in 2005. My dear mother, Sarah, the matriarch of this family, was 99 years old when she died in 2007, a few months after Ted, not of old age, but of heartbreak, over losing her son, the judge. She lived on Miami Beach and was the queen of the Lincoln Road Mall. Her final comment is I showed her these documents before she died, and I asked her, what do you think, Mommy, of all this research I did? She said in her Hungarian accent, darling, we still owe $300 to the Hayas. <laughs> so it seems as I stand here before you, I am the only one left of this little family of four who ran, hid, and escaped the Holocaust. Still standing, <clears throat> why have I been spared in these last years of deep losses? I don't know. But I must only assume it is to keep telling this story, to speak for Maurice, for Sarah, and for Tibor, until my voice will no longer be heard, and then you, my teachers I usually speak to, are charged with telling the story for me. My final comment is I once heard a refugee child survivor of the Holocaust say, the experience of my parents is woven through the fabric of my soul, and I am compelled to tell it to the world. Thank you for letting me share this with you.